Artist Rachel Louise Brown creates eerie, dreamlike photographs that blur the boundaries between the real and the imaginary. Fascinated by the way in which we build our environments and act or perform within them, she makes work in which she explores themes of escapism, gender construction and hyperreality. She also enjoys the way that her own psychology impacts the work. Choosing to explore unfamiliar places alone and at night, it's often her own feelings of fear and unease when she's shooting that amplifies the strange, otherworldly atmosphere in the resulting images. Taking these themes and motifs as a starting point, she made her most recent series, Simulations, in Florida. Over a period of four years, Rachel photographed some of the theme parks, roadside attractions and places of escapism that the state is renowned for. I caught up with her recently over a Zoom call and we talked about her experiences, her process, and how the work evolved during this time. Hi Rachel, how are you? Hey Claire, I'm good thank you, how are you? I'm well thanks. Thanks for agreeing to talk to me today. So we're here to talk about your series Simulations, but before we start talking about the works, could we talk a bit about your background and how you started working with photography? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started working with photography when uh, I was about 15 years old. Um, I'm from the north of England, from a town called Huddersfield, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. But at that point in time, uh, during my childhood, it was quite a bleak place that felt to be lacking in opportunity. And I was always sort of looking for a way to spread my wings and um, find the world. And initially, my passion um, was journalism. Um, and at the age of 12, I, I entered a competition at the local newspaper and I actually won it with this terrible sort of cut and paste Blue Peter style newspaper. And anyway, I worked there for two weeks and during that time I shadowed the staff photographer and I got to go on assignment with him to various places and I knew instantly that photography would become my sort of method for storytelling. And the irony now is that Huddersfield is actually a really thriving place with um, a first-class university and a photography department that's unbelievable. And um, yeah, I, I go back there to guest lecture sometimes. So, you know, home is where the heart is and all that. So what was the starting point for the simulations project? And could you tell us a bit about the evolution of the work? Yeah, absolutely. So simulations actually began as an idea seven years prior to making it. So in 2008, I moved um, to New York from the UK to do an artist residency at the School of Visual Arts. And I'd never been anywhere except mainland Europe, and I think I'd only been there once. So uprooting and moving across the world was quite a significant event for me. Um, and I'd gone there with this sort of initial idea, this project proposal to work with beauty pageants and look at, looking at the construction of um, femininity within that realm. And what I actually ended up doing was working with um, the feelings of displacement that I was experiencing when I first moved there. Mm. But I had this real um, sort of uh, learnt memory of America. I'd consumed so many films and books um, throughout my sort of childhood and teenage years that I had this idea of what it was gonna be like. And when I was there, I had this um, sort of feeling like I was viewing my own reality from outside of itself, like I was in a sort of psychological thriller. And I decided to hand the beauty pageant idea and made work instinctively instead. Um, and I ended up exploring these feelings and pushing them further. Mm. So I went to um, upstate New York and wandered around these sleepy villages, trespassing and exploring alone at night, because I felt that that really heightened these feelings that I was already having. Um, and when I developed the films, it was like a, a light bulb had gone on. And I suddenly realized photography has this incredible power to um, absorb the psychology of the person making the picture and also this power to abstract um, reality from itself. So that's a very sort of long-winded way of getting to my point where once I started making that work, I was told to read um, an essay by Jean Baudrillard, the French philosopher called Simulacra and Simulation. And in it, he talks about the fact that our everyday existence is no longer real and that we, as a, a society sort of across the world we create these imagination stations to distract us from the fact that our everyday reality is actually a simulation and so are we and I got really caught up on these ideas and I thought where could I go and explore, explore them further um, 
in Florida advertised, you know, as the place to go for thrill seeking and escapism was the place that I really wanted to go to explore these ideas. Um, and luckily there was an artist residency there at the Palm Beach Photographic Center. And I applied and was accepted um, and went and made work there over four years. Could you talk to us about the, the process while you were there then? For all of my projects, there's two key processes that I use in making the images. The first is a continuation of what I did in New York, which is this wandering alone at nighttime, exploring unfamiliar environments with a big medium format, slow, cumbersome camera. I can't get anywhere fast with that. Mm. Um, and the second process involves working with strangers who I cast. Um, there are always people that are from the locality of that place. Um, so for example, in, in Florida, the first year I went there in 2014, I focused purely on the local nighttime explorations. And I learned pretty swiftly on that first night of being there that doing that on the island of Palm Beach, which as um, you may have heard is a very affluent, exclusive island. Um, so there was no way that I could do that there. And I had to cross the bridge and do the exploration in West Palm Beach, which is a place that was initially constructed for the, the workers, those who served the people that lived on the island. Mm -hmm. So I had instantly been thrown off what I thought I was going to be doing. And I ended up wandering e these streets that were even more unfamiliar to me because I hadn't planned to go there. Um, and I was documenting local places of escapism there, such as um, the ice cream stand picture. And there's one of a beauty parlor and another of um, a like a tackle, like a bit called the bait shop. And you, the US is a really big driving culture. So these places have to really entice people into them. So the architecture and the signage is always over the top and um, really hyper real. And then um, I went back in 2015. And that year, I did the casting calls to work with strangers in environments of their choosing. And the third year that I went back to Florida was 2017. And on that particular visit, I decided to photograph imagination stations further afield. So I went up to Orlando to photograph at Disney and a Christian um, theme park called the Holy Land, which was actually the most scary place that I've been. They tried to take my camera off me. Um, and then I went across the States to, ta to Tampa to a little um, town just north of Tampa, where there was an eight-year-old mermaid show, um, which whilst I was there, I found out that there was a curfew in place because a serial killer was going around, I think it was a seven, seven mile radius of this place, killing women who were by themselves in parking lots. Um, so needless to say, I didn't go out at night. Um, but the, first, the photographing of the mermaid was really key to the whole project because I realized when I photographed that show that actually I was quite interested in how people train to become a simulation. So the project evolved again and I decided to cast um, people who train to become simulations. So it, um, people such as ballerinas and gymnasts and I photographed a, a stripper as well. Um, and then collectively, all of these images came together as simulations. Could you talk about what it is that compels you to shoot in certain spaces? So in, in a nutshell, um, it's the construction of the space that compels me to shoot within it. I'm sort of like a moth to a flame. And it's very much to do with the lighting of the space and the, sort of the learned memories it perhaps evokes in me from content that I've consumed within film and literature. Um, I also feel like, it, especially at nighttime, the, the cinematic mise-en-scene of a place really comes to life. And um, not just at night though, within artificially lit spaces, the same thing happens for me. And I'm very much interested too in, in the spaces that are constructed to house somebody who performs. So for mm -hmm. example, The Mermaid. To what extent are the works about your own personal relationship to the space that you're working in? That's a really interesting question. I've, uh, I've never been asked that before. I mean, for me, the imagery created relies primarily on that. So it's very much about my um, psychological response to the situation that I'm in. And I use that as a catalyst for the creation of the image. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of using myself as a vessel. And the space performs for the photograph, depending on how I'm 
responding to it psychologically. And then on the other, with the other process working with strangers, I'm really interested in how they perform for the image too. They perceive me as a director, um, but all I actually do is I frame, I frame the space. Uh, so I'm, I'm choosing the mise-en-scene and then I, I get them to look through the viewfinder of the camera to see that space and then they go into it and they perform however they wish to. Mm -hmm. So it's very much for me a, a study into how they choose to perform within that space. So it's about their psychological response to myself, the space and this idea of becoming a character within it. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same too, actually, when I work with a group. So for instance, the ballerinas or the gymnasts, they look through the viewfinder and they look at the space and then they go into it. But with that study, what's quite interesting is how the group interact amongst each other and with each other. How often do you visit a place before you decide to shoot there? So whenever I photograph a place, it's always the first time that I'm encountering it. And um, you know, they're often places that I've discovered whilst exploring. But sometimes, um, like with Disney and Mar-a-Lago, I have a learned memory from popular culture before I go there. But the t when I photograph it, it is the first time that I've been there in the flesh. And I think it's really important that the psychology that's experienced is fresh. And same with the strangers. We, we interact via email, but when we meet, it's for one roll of film and it's for the first time. Why do you choose to shoot it, often to shoot at night time? So I choose to shoot primarily at night because it's the realm where the familiar becomes unfamiliar. And I really, I'm really fascinated with how that enhances the narrative of the unknown. Also, as a female, I'm taught not to go out at night on my own. You know, it's to be avoided. Um, and I think one of the reasons that I want to do this is, is a reclaiming of the night. It's a mm -hmm. facing of the fear that I've been taught to have. So it becomes the work and the process behind it is a, is a sort of feminist performance. Could you explain how you came to meet your subjects and as an outsider, how you found it coming into and being accepted by the community? So whenever I do a project, um, I try to collaborate with an artist residency, um, partly for, for funding reasons and often you'll get a place to live in a studio space, um, but also to have the starting point of a network within the local place of what I would hope would be like-minded people who are quite open to the world. Um, so I have a sort of safety net in place, um, particularly with the fact that I work with um, wandering unfamiliar places and working with strangers, it's good to have that security there. Yeah. Um, but also for the local knowledge. So I gave an artist talk when I first got to Palm Beach and talked about my fascination with imagination stations and ended up finding out about places that I would never have found through my own research. Um, I also found out that there was a, a newspaper that just went out to Palm Beach Island called The Shiny Sheet. And um, through that network, I ended up meeting um, one of the editors who published a casting call on the front page for the project. So I would say that the artist residency really gives me a grounding and um, access. And you know that you have a group of people that will accept you, even if people in the wider sphere of Florida perhaps didn't all the time. Could you tell us about the self-portrait that you shot in the Breakers Hotel? Yeah, so, so actually there is a third smaller process to the way that I work. Um, whenever I do a project, I always take a self-portrait at the end as a sort of full stop to the project. And um, the reason that I did that one in the Breakers um, ballroom was because I hadn't been able to get the level of access to people who lived on Palm Beach um, that I thought I would. So when I put the casting call out in the shiny sheet, the the majority of people who responded were from West Palm Beach and they were people that aspired to be from the island. Um, so because I couldn't get access to them, I decided to become one. Um, it's not about me and my identity. It's always about a sort of summary of the experience, hence the reason that I'm blurred within the picture. So I borrowed from the island's only thrift store the church mouse, a lot of gowns that were owned by 
with socialite women of the island. And I went there by myself with my camera and suitcases of clothing and I put them on and I danced and it was such a liberating experience and a really quite nice way to end the project. Mm -hmm. And often I take these self portraits and they don't make it into the final project, um, but this one did. Were there any memorable characters you met or experiences that you had during your time shooting for the series in, in Florida? So many, so many. Every image came with its own crazy story, but some of the key ones were the ones that had evolved the project in some way. So the first year that I was there, um, I ended up photographing at a place called Fright Nights, which was a haunted house created every year by locals. So slightly more outside of West Palm Beach, a more rural town, they built a haunted house that had no health and safety that recruited actors who were just local teenagers. And um, I remember going there and as I went in with my giant camera on the tripod, a zombie ran towards me with a chainsaw and I was absolutely terrified. Um, but they were so kind to me, they gave me access all areas and I could go behind the scenes of the haunted houses. And on one evening, I stationed myself at the end of it, of the haunted house, getting people as they had come through it. And there was this girl there who was dressed as um, a lobster. She had lobster hands. And she must have been 13 or 14 years old. And I said to her, do you mind if I take your picture? And she never broke character once. She just stared at me with these really quite intense um, eyes. And the, the image is in the series, um, she's called The Lobster Girl. And I think it really captures just uh, that, that moment, that interaction between her and I. And yeah, sorry, I'm just going back there in my mind. Um, what I found quite important about her was that she, she hadn't had any training. She was just becoming something that she was imagining. She, mm -hmm. hadn't, she wasn't a trained actor, she was just a local girl and she was so terrifying. But she gave me the sort of inc inclination to actually then start casting people to become a part of the project. Right, yeah. A key, a key turning point. There's a filmic quality that characterizes much of your work. How bigger part does cinematography play for you and who are your heroes within that field? So cinematography is um, it's hugely inf influential to my process and I'm really fascinated with how the cine camera frames scenes and omits detail to sort of enhance narrative and build suspense. Um, I guess I'm less, I'm less influenced by specific films and more about genre um, and I'm also really interested in how staging and casting and lighting as a as a whole um, comes together to evoke specific emotions in the audience. Um, if I had to give any specific directors, I'd probably mention David Lynch and Alfred Hitchcock, um, particularly their sort of staging of suspense and the use of colour. And within my own work, I really try to take on these ideas of, of casting, um, which I then apply to existing stages that are already out there um, and are already lit. I don't have the budget yet to create my own, but perhaps one day. Um, for, for lighting, um, Wong Kar Wai, he is incredible. His film Mood for Love is sublime. Um, but then I'm really also influenced by painting, in particular that of Edward Hopper. His right. cinematic, um, his paintings are so cinematic in the way that they frame an isolated individual within a bigger space. And they're, sort of, they're really charged moments, which I find very exquisite. What do you hope that the viewer will take away from your work? So we are bombarded with imagery um, since the advent of the digital realm. And what I hope with my work is that it sort of creates a pause for thought and that the, the sense of strangeness within, within some of it, within the majority of it, draws in the viewer and allows them to consider the, the construction of their environment, of the environments that they go into and also the performances that they encounter um, and even the performance of the self in general. And, you know, I'd like them to sort of question whether our reality is a simulation and what place um, does escapism provide within it? 
you know, obviously with, with lockdown, I think we've all come to realise that escapism is very much needed. Can you tell us what you'll be working on next? Yes. So um, before lockdown, I'd actually started making a project with the Household Cavalry. So, you know, they're, they're such a, a renowned institution um, within British identity, this, this performed pageantry that happens every day in central London. Um, but they have, interestingly, in the last year, just recruited female officers for the first time to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So I was starting to work with them to document these new recruits. Um, and what I found really fascinating about being afforded the opportunity to be behind the scenes there is to record moments where the individual becomes apparent within because you see the, the cavalry and their performance you don't see the individual you see the collective mm -hmm. and there were these great moments behind the scenes where one of the the guys um whilst they're all on their horses in their full regalia would just lose his moment and become himself and in the picture of the collective you would see him and that's mm -hmm. what i was wanting to get but with the female recruits and then, then lockdown happened so hopefully I'll be able to go back. Um, I'm also hoping to evolve simulations in Vegas. I can think of nowhere better to go to explore hyperreality and escapism further. Well I wish you luck with that and I can't wait to see the results. Um, thanks so much for talking to me today and enjoy the rest of your day. Oh thank you Claire and thank you for giving up so much of the Sunday. <laughs> You're absolutely welcome. Thanks a lot. Bye. See you soon. Bye.